North Carolina Real Estate Show. I'm Tiffany Weber, your host, an attorney at Thomason Weber in Mooresville, North Carolina, and I'm joined today again by Erin Weatherman. Welcome. Thank you for having me. She knows a lot about the contract and she's great at talking about it. So we're going to finish up over the next two episodes our discussion of the North Carolina Standard Offer to Purchase. We are going to pick up where we left off at number nine. What better thing to talk about than money? Everybody's favorite or least favorite subject, depending And specifically, on which side. <laughs> HOA money. Oh, not even yours. <laughs> um, so number nine is all about that charges by the owner's association. So what the seller is going to be responsible for paying and what the buyer is going to be responsible for paying. So a lot of those seller fees that we see on closing disclosures or Alta specifically really say those HOA verification fees. Mm -hmm. Those are your HOA breakup fees. It mm -hmm. hurts to break up. Um, yeah, and for sure. It costs some money too. <laughs> um, <laughs> and then really the buyer side, you see things like the capital contribution fee and then your regular HOA dues as well. But mm -hmm. that capital contribution fee always raises some eyebrows. Mm -hmm. Yes, it does. Like, so I have to buy into this? Like, yeah, it's kind of like when you're buying into an LLC, you have to yep. make a capital contribution. It's really similar. Because um, that goes into the fund to maybe there's road maintenance that needs to be done or upkeep to the monument sign. I want to point out in the new contract that's different than the old contract. For the most part, if the HOA or the management company is charging a fee other than the capital contribution and a few things in 9B, the seller pays it. And in fact, now there's a new line in here, 9A4. Any fees other than those specifically required to be paid by buyer under paragraph 9B below are to be paid by seller. So that means anything that's on that sheet that gets sent to the closing attorney's office, if it doesn't fall under 9B, the seller has to pay it. And you agree to that in the contract. So when you see the closing statement and you're like, I never said I would pay that. Yes, you did. Okay, so moving on to prorations and adjustments. What do you got? So we prorate taxes. Um, everybody <laughs> loves to talk about taxes mm -hmm. um, all times of the year. But taxes are prorated on that calendar year basis. <laughs> yes, this is a point a near and button. dear to my heart. <laughs> I think people get tripped up because the fact that the tax office operates on a fiscal year, their mm -hmm. budget may be a fiscal year from July to June. Okay. But the taxes are prorated on a calendar year basis. So it doesn't matter what the, the county's budget is. Um, you're not paid up from July to June. You're paid up from January 1st to December 31st. The lien relates back to January 1st. So there's all sorts of legal reasons why it's done this way. But quite frankly, none of those things really matter because unless you change this contract, it's what you agreed to do in the contract. Yep. Ultimately, that is the most important thing, that contract. Um, so after that, the taxes on personal property. So the seller is responsible for your taxes, for your personal property, unless that personal property is conveyed to the buyer. So you get that nice, nice lake lot um, and you get that boat. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> That's where that comes into play as to whether those personal property taxes transfer. Mm -hmm. After that, that rent. And so if there is a tenant occupying the property as well, that that rent is going to be prorated and owner's association dues, so your HOA dues are going to be prorated mm -hmm. as well. Well, the next part, paragraph 11, talks about, I think this one's pretty to the point, condition of the property and the risk of loss. So when you go under contract, basically at the time the contract is signed, imagine that time is frozen take a snapshot in time of what is the condition of the property. All right, let's fast forward to closing. The property needs to be to match that snapshot or be mm -hmm. better. Yeah. So whatever condition it was at the time the contract is signed, same or better condition. Yeah. If it's in worse condition, the seller's got to make it right. This is substantially the same. So let's say, you know, all the walls are painted beige, but then by the time of closing, they're painted white. You know, that's that's not worse condition. You know, to my mind, that's not something that would violate this provision. Same or better condition. And then also, until closing, the risk of damage to the property, the risk of loss of the property is on the seller. If you've been in a closing in our office, then as a seller, then you have heard me or you, Aaron, or Erica, saying to you as a seller, we recommend 
that you do not cancel your insurance until the deed is recorded. And in fact, we have you initial a paragraph saying that we had that discussion. So in a closing the other day, I had an agent tell me this story about how they, it was because we just had the hurricane recently. Mm -hmm. And so. Or as my husband likes to say, the hurricane. (laughs) I'm sorry. I love it. (laughs) Um, And so she said, a couple years back, she had a closing that was on a Friday right before a hurricane. And it was a late closing. So they did. I'm very nervous about where this is going. <laughs> you should be. Oh. <laughs> um, so the closing was on a Friday, 4 p.m. The seller still owns the property. That deed didn't get recorded until Monday. Mm-hmm. Well, the hurricane came over the weekend. Saturday, tree comes through the house. No. Destroys the roof. No. And so then it was... The seller removed their insurance. Um, No, no. (laughs) Well, they closed on Friday, so why wouldn't they? And so it was very problematic. Mm -hmm. So the seller got that roof done, but they did it out of pocket. Ouch. Yeah, ouch is right. This next one, delay in settlement and closing. This one, another, another paragraph that's near and dear to me because it's often argued over. And this has changed a little bit from, you know, we had a change to the contract last July, but this paragraph has changed a couple times since then. Yeah. It used to give 14 days to the non-delaying party. That's now been shortened to seven. Tell me a little bit about how do you delay settlement? How long do you get? And then I want to discuss some nuance there. So really, you should notify everyone as soon as you know a delay is going to happen, whether that be because your lender is going to delay it because they don't have all their numbers finalized or because you need to delay it for whatever, well, not whatever reason, but any (laughs) good faith reason that you're still actually trying to go through with this purchase. And you get up to seven days to do that. So you get seven days, but the caveat is that after that seven days, then your seller can terminate the mm-hmm. contract. And so that's an important day, that seven-day mark. And there is one word in here, two words in here. Two words in this paragraph really make the whole thing as to whether the paragraph even applies. So it says, this paragraph shall apply if one party is ready, willing, and able to complete settlement on the settlement date, but it is not possible for the other party to complete settlement. Not possible. Synonym for impossible. Yeah. <laughs> so if it is impossible to complete closing on the settlement date, impossible doesn't mean that you were slacking on giving your lender the docs. Yeah. Impossible doesn't mean that you forgot to go send your wire. Um, forgetful is not impossible. Not being diligent is not impossible. This has to be something that's out of your control that you really, you know, you kind of have to be blameless in the whole situation. Yeah. If you are not blameless, if you in fact cause the reason that you can't close on the date that you said you would close, then you are not entitled to a delay in settlement. This is the paragraph I think that can most often lead to disputes among the parties uh, because, you know, buyer might say, oh, well, I I can't send the wire because I have to be in person and my bank is in Massachusetts. Okay, well, your bank has been in Massachusetts this whole time. (laughs) <laughs> and you are advised to make arrangements for your wire well in advance. And the fact that you realize the morning of closing that your Massachusetts bank wouldn't let you send a wire, that's not impossible. That's not being diligent. You're not automatically entitled to that seven days. All right, number 13, possession. Tell me about that. So a couple options here. It's really if you're having a buyer possess before closing, a seller possession after closing, Um, Or those tenants are in that property still. And so we saw a lot of this with the hot market this past year. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Everybody wanted to buy houses. We had so many seller possessions after closing. Mm -hmm. More Um, than I've probably ever seen. (laughs) Yeah. And so those are really those possession addendums of all of those standard forms you can use for the buyer possession and the seller possession after closing and taking subject to a tenant as Mm -hmm. well. And if you don't have one of those addendums, then at closing, you got to deliver possession. So that's keys, garage codes, or garage door openers. Um, Any, you know, anything that's electronic that allows you to get into the property, whatever it takes to get into the property, all means of possession have to be delivered at closing, unless you're in one of those Um, in one of those scenarios. Well, that concludes this
portion of the contract. That's been the discussion of sections 9 through 13 of the contract. On our next episode, we're going to pick it up with section 14 and finish it out. So please join us. And thanks for listening to the North Carolina Real Estate Show. <laughs>